Welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair, and me, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker. Based in Vancouver, Evelyn Lau is the author of 13 books, including eight volumes of poetry. Her poetry has received the Milton Acorn People's Poetry Award, the Pat Lowther Award for Best Book of Poetry by a Canadian Woman, and nominations for a BC Book Prize and a Governor General's Award. From 2011 to 2014, Evelyn served as Vancouver's Poet Laureate. Her new book is Pineapple Express. Welcome, Evelyn Lau. Thank you, Irene. So when did you first fall in love with writing? Oh, well, I was one of those strange children who knew from an extremely young age that writing was going to be my path in life. Um, You know, like a lot of, I think, you know, like a lot of young writers or young would-be writers, um, I was shy and introvert and books and writing, you know, the life on the page to me was more real and more accessible perhaps than the life around me um, and more comforting. So um, I disappeared into books. I, um, you know, as a sort of person who walked down the street with a book in my hand, you know, reading as I went. Um, So I think for, you know, I've talked to other writers who have had a similar experience, but it didn't occur to them that writing and reading kind of went hand in hand, that that was something that they could do. But for me, um, from a very young age, like from the age of six, I felt that this was going to be my way of living in the world um, was to be a writer. Other people, you know, the same experience that I was receiving as as an ardent reader. So what is your writing routine like? Um, How do you carve out time? Do you have a particular uh, way of keeping on track? Oh, I wish I could say that I was the sort of writer who woke up at a certain time every day and, you know, worked diligently for a couple of hours at the desk. And and it has rarely been like that for me. Um, in the years that I was writing prose, it was, I think prose lends itself to more of that kind of routine and that sort of external discipline. But it's been my experience that with poetry, so much of the work of poetry is actually not sitting at the desk. It's going for walks. It's thinking. It's um, going over, you know, those line breaks and those metaphors and, and the punctuation. You know, even the smallest, most minute thing in a poem can make such a difference in terms of how the mood of the poem comes across. So, so much of the work of writing poetry for me is just, is walking every day, thinking about what I'm working on, um, but the actual sitting down at the desk and, and, and carving out those lines is actually a very small part of the work of writing. Your new poetry collection is Pineapple Express. Um, What inspired the title? Where did that come from? I wanted a kind of sunnier title than my last book, which was Tumor. It had a very dark cover. And even though this book is, um, focuses on the disorders of the mind, um, depression, uh, mental health, obsessive thinking, I wanted there to be light in it as well, too. And living in Vancouver, we have these pineapple express weather systems that come in from from Hawaii. And I was thinking about how, you know, depression can be like that or, or, you know, disordered thinking can be like that. It can be like a a weather system that moves through and just dumps rain on you, but it, it moves past as well. So as you've said, Pineapple Express covers a lot of themes, body image, mental illness, medication, isolation, family dynamics, self-identity. How did this project begin for you and how did it gradually take shape? It's always hard for me to think of my poetry collections in a kind of coherent way because I 
I'm so focused on every individual poem that each poem is like its own world. So I'm probably at least halfway through a manuscript before it starts occurring to me that there are themes and that there are, um, you know, uh, there is a shape to the book. Um, I think because my previous book was so focused on the physical body and how that changes with age, it seemed like a natural thing to move inward and to think about how, you know, the mental landscape also changes as we age. Chatting with us now, we really appreciate your willingness to find your way to a computer for this interview <laughs> because you are famous for staying offline as much as possible, and I'm a little jealous of you for that. How has that practice of maintaining distance from technology helped you as a writer? It has felt really necessary to me as a writer. I know right, right now in particular, it isn't practical. <laughs> um, and I end up having to go through all sorts of contortions to do my work um, and, and not have, you know, internet at home. Um, but I find, you know, I, I have always found technology a huge distraction to the point where, you know, whatever its gifts are, are just, it's just not worthwhile for me especially with poetry, I just, I really need to focus and I need to kind of clear my head and clear my little space, my little apartment, and just, you know, sit with the images and the words and the emotions. And, you know, as we all know, technology is the opposite of, of that focus. It's, you know, you're constantly, there's just so much distraction. There's so much you know, it's so easy to fritter away your time and your focus on things that are, you know, ultimately they don't, they don't um, give anything back to you. So yeah, it's, it's something I've just known for myself as being really important. And even here, you know, sitting here with all of your faces in front of me, it's, it's a really eerie feeling. It's like brave new world, you know? <laughs> but it's also, it's kind of, you know, there's that strange disjointed kind of quality too, right? With this whole thing that is, it's very unnerving, <laughs> I have to say. So excuse me if my, I'm not as, I feel really scattered as opposed to if I was sitting with my landline, you know, phone in my hand and I, and I was just focusing on your voices. This is really, it's a lot of information. <laughs> it gives well, me a strange kind of joy to feel unnerving right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Kind of power that I'm seizing. I'm so happy right now. Anyway, <laughs> you have published an astonishing 13 books. How do you think you've grown as a writer since you published Runaway Diary of a Street Kid? Oh my God, wouldn't it be tragic if I hadn't grown? <laughs> and yet, you know, this is. Uh, my first book that I published when I was 18 and wrote as a teenager is out of the 13 books, the only one that actually earns royalties. Because even now, 30 years later, people are still reading that book. So I'm like, did I peak at 15 you know, when I was writing my first book? Is it all downhill um, from there? It's, it's ironic, right? Because I think, um, you know, obviously my work is far more polished, thoughtful, layered, right, um, than it was as a teenager who is simply trying to find some kind of catharsis in writing versus trying to create something that is artistic and sculpted. You know, I spend so much time with my lines and my sentences now and that precision is so important to me as a writer, whereas the first book was really just kind of a blurt, you know, of emotion and experience on the page without any of that artistry. And yet that was what appealed to people because I guess, you know, looking back, there is very little writing by adolescents that truly documents, you know, without any artifice, that experience of adolescent angst and rage and, and self-destructiveness, right? I mean, if I were to write that book now, it would be a completely different book. I mean, I like to think it would be a better book in terms of the writing, but it wouldn't have that raw power of, of writing about something at the time when you are young and you have no sense of future or perspective. 
So, you know, from that point of view, I'm glad that exists, but it is a little, you know, disconcerting <laughs> to think all these years of effort, especially with poetry, that it resonates with so few people. Right. And yet, you know, we can't as writers, you know, one of the things about growing older, you realize that you are absolutely not in control of how your work is received. And, you know, and writing poetry, you're destined, you know, unless you're that very, very rare person out there, you're destined to have a very small audience. And as one poet, I remember pointed out to me, you know, perhaps your audience isn't even born yet you know, the audience for your, for your poems, because I guess one hope with poetry is that it has a kind of timelessness, that it exists in a space that isn't confined by what is fashionable in the moment. And maybe it will be meaningful to somebody who hasn't discovered it yet in a way that, you know, poetry to us as readers is meaningful and seems to exist outside of the time in which it was written. Talking about Runaway Diary of a Street Kid and its appeal, it's been translated into French and German and Italian and Polish and many other languages. What do you think accounts for the global nature of the appeal? Again, I think my youth at the time, you know, it was and still is unusual to have a document by a young person who has written so compulsively about their experience. You know, we have writers now, like Yasu Kotan is writing about her adolescence, but she's, I think, in her 40s now. Um, and she also was on the street as a teenager. But, you know, so we have stories like that coming out more and more, you know, women's stories all the time, you know, essays, memoirs. I just read a, a piece by a writer I discovered recently, an American writer, Otessa Mosh. I don't know if you know her work. Fantastic. Um, a really original voice, but I just discovered, I just read a piece of hers in Ungranta that she wrote at the age of 39 about when she was 17 and having a relationship with a 65 year old male writer, you know, and so it's very, very different when you write about those traumas later on, because of course you have, we're judgmental, we should be judgmental, right, about those sorts of things. But the beauty of writing about it at the time is that you don't have a sense of judgment. I mean, you just, because you don't, you're not an adult yet, right? You're just trying to survive the experience and you're writing about it without any kind of sense of right or wrong or any gloss over, you know, the ugliness or maybe, you know, what is, you know, what appeals to you about it or the feeling of power that you have. You're not trying to censor any of those things. You're just writing about it. And I think that is still rare. So what's your next project? Well, I'm, I'm working on another collection of poetry. <laughs> um, I'm just, yeah, it, uh, I'm very focused on it right now. You know, poetry, writing poetry is really partly a process of letting go of ego. And I see this all the time in students or in emerging writers. They're, they're very attached, of course, to how the public might respond to their work. And that's legitimate with prose. I think with poetry, you realize very, very quickly that there is a very small public who, that is interested in your work. And the average, the general person hasn't a clue what you're doing, nor do they want to know. <laughs> so um, the rewards end up being in the craft itself, because I think if you make the mistake of thinking that it will be in in how people respond to your work, you'll be disappointed. So for me, I've learned to find a real joy and satisfaction in, in wrestling with draft after draft of each poem. And this, this new collection I'm working on has just been making me tear my hair out because I, I've you know reconfigured it in all kinds of ways and I have not been happy and I'm still not happy. And I'm thinking, oh my God, am I getting worse as I get older? <laughs> You know, that's the thing as you, as you know, if you have a long career as a writer, you do see these, you know, ups and downs and these, you know, and you think, well, maybe I did peak at a certain age and now perhaps I'm getting to the point where I'm repeating myself. These things happen, right? Or, but you also don't know if maybe 10 years from now, you are going to stumble upon some new way of looking at things that, that is fresh and unprecedented 
right? You don't know. So you keep going. That's all you can do. Would you like to read something for our listeners? Sure. I will read something from Pineapple Express. And I'll read, just because we are sitting, I don't know what things are like in Windsor right now, but we are getting the wildfires in Vancouver. The smoke is blowing up from California and Oregon and Washington. And what should be a gorgeous summer day is choked with smoke right now. So this was a poem I wrote a, a couple years ago when we had a similar experience with the fires within the province. It's called Tinder Dry. This time, the silence goes on for weeks. In dreams, you write epics, ink dripping onto vellum, a flight of blackbirds, the land of the subconscious, lush as a rainforest. Summer started two months early and never went away. Everyone's too hot to move, gasping in the particulate air. The arrow bobbing into the red zone of extreme, each of us in our fire towers, scanning the horizon for a spark. Yesterday, you scuffed a heap of leaves underfoot, charred and chocolate brown in the first week of July. The trees have shrunk inward, conserving their cores by shedding even their branches, snapping off, slamming down on parked cars. Hundreds of wildfires across the province and our own small green world bordered by blue has become an inverted bowl choked with smoke. Sand in the eyes, a scorched throat, each breath a slow burn, each exhale a smudge of charcoal. This air so parched and strange, your hands shake. You strain to sip some oxygen from the clogged atmosphere, cough and cough in the porous light. The maples along the seawall gone white like soda ash, heaps of salt. The beaten metal, copper and aluminum of the sea. You wake to a room all gold, walls painted gold, furniture cast in gold. Sunlight shot through a brocade of smog. Someday soon, you think, the words will leave you, but you'll still be here. Wonderful. Oh. Thank, you. Thank you so much for being with us, Evelyn Lau. Thank you for having me. This has been an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, if nothing else. And thank you for your thoughtful questions. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.